sports. Uh, I understand that you are a longtime New Yorker. You did your training at Cornell Fellowship at LIJ, and now you are the Director of Robotic and Laparoscopic Surgery at the Smith Institute for Urology, as well as the Residency Program Director for LIJ in Northwell. Um, that is great. Thank you so much for joining us today. This topic is, I can personally attest, is super high yield for boards, super high yield for in-service. I think there is always at least one question on this exact topic on every one of those exams I've ever taken. So I'm really glad uh, that you are going to give us a presentation today. Um, we're starting out all the talks by just a quick um, kind of um, biographical um, description from you about how you uh, got involved in urology and uh, maybe a little description of your career pathway and what brought you to um, the point you're at now, if you don't mind. Um, sure. Um, you know, I got into urology, you know, as probably many people do almost by a fluke. Um, you know, I was uh, rotating on an OBGYN service in medical school and um, the faculty mentor I had speaking to him about, you know, career choices, et cetera, um, had suggested I check out urology because I was quite interested in some of what OBGYN had to offer, but I really was not interested in obstetrics, but I liked, as many of us do, kind of the longitudinal aspect of care and also getting into procedurals and surgeries and things. So. Um, I, I found urology and uh, I was a medical student at Brown University at the time and uh, had a wonderful faculty mentor there who was a pediatric urologist named Tony Caldamone, who may, many people may know. Um, and I came into urology thinking I was going to be an, a pediatric urologist after that experience and then uh, discovered oncology and, and minimally invasive surgery and really found my, my niche in that in that realm um so i came to cornell um as a as a resident and then out here in long island as a fellow with uh with lou calusi and stayed on as faculty here and as you said have since become program director um and um i think that uh you know more or less covers it but if anybody has any questions about them have an answer but we can get get into the the topic yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, I will turn it over to you. Um, it, it, we're going to have people submit questions in the chat here. So sure. at the end, uh, if you leave five or 10 minutes, we'll do a brief Q&A. Yeah, we, we should have, have time for that. So um, so this talk covers both the physiology and some of the complications of pneumoperitoneum and some of the access uh, methods that we, we use to gain our access for our minimally invasive surgical cases. So we'll get into that. Um, and this comes out of Campbell's, by the way. So if people have uh, things they want to refer back to or look up in more detail, please. Uh, this this really is uh, coming out of the Campbell's chapter. Sorry. So uh, first of all, what do we choose for gas insufflation, and you know, and why do we do it? So CO2 is the most common, and I'm sure everybody's familiar with this um, at their institutions. Um, why do we use it? It's a colorless gas, so it doesn't impede our vision. It's not combustible. It's soluble in blood, which is probably one of the most important features, um, and it's inexpensive. Um, so it makes a lot of sense for these reasons. And then an alternative is helium. Now, I don't use this a whole lot in practice, but if somebody happens to be someone who might have a poor tolerance for hypercarbia, in other words, someone who has significant COPD and you're doing a laparoscopic surgery, um, this uh, is also non-combustible, it's colorless, et cetera, um, but uh, because it does not dissolve in the bloodstream, it does not have the potential to cause hypercarbia in somebody who already have, may have a significant issue with this at baseline. So it's another choice, but one that we don't use a whole lot, but, but just know that it's out there. Um, pressures for insufflation. So, most commonly, I think most surgeons are using 15 millimeters of mercury. And we do that for a few reasons. One, it gives us good working space and visualization. It also helps control bleeding. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a great way of, of minimizing blood loss in surgeries that are, you know, otherwise would be open. There's more significant bleeding related to the lack of this pressure. Um, and, you know, but in reality, we could probably use a lower 
uh, pressure point here, um, as some of the lower pressures have been shown to have less alterac alterations physiologically, in particular cardiac and with postoperative pain. Um, so it's not unreasonable to go down to 12 or 11, and sometimes we do this, uh, sometimes we don't, but, but just know, again, it's an option. And then you can also use lower pressures. There's less oliguria, but then you ultimately end up with less working space and you may have more bleeding. So some of the physiologic effects, um, there, the way that Campbell's kind of sets this up and I presented it here is by local effects and by systemic effects. So locally you get peritoneal distension and, and this can cause a, a basal reaction. The diaphragm is elevated and you also alter venous return, um, and the distension of the diaphragm and the, and the abdominal space can cause pain. Uh, 